Uh, it's been developed, I guess, by me up at Victoria University. Um, and I've got a website, you can download it. It's been in development for maybe two, two years, sort of on and off. Mostly the last year is when it's really started to ramp up and um, it sort of started to get a bit more serious. Um, and I guess, I guess the obvious question, right? I mean, you know, we think about it, we've got, I don't even remember all of them now, Closure, you know, we've got Scarlet, obviously quite old now, really, to be honest. Uh, we've got um, Ceylon, how do you say that, Ceylon? We've got Dart. Um, there's other interesting ones like uh, Mirror, all sorts of programming languages, right? The programming the JVM, Groovy, of course. I can have Groovy, okay, right? Groovy plus plus, is it Groovy plus plus? Yeah, okay. Um, you know, uh, there seems to be new ones coming out all the time. Rust, I don't know if you guys have heard of Rust, the one that um, Mozilla's developing. So there's a lot of programming languages, and I guess... And Racket. Racket, yep, thank you. Fantastic PLT scheme, formerly known as. Um, any more? Did I, I must have forgotten something else that came out recently. Kotlin. Which one? Kotlin. Go, yeah, Go is a good one. Kotlin, yep. Extend. Uh, is that the Eclipse one that's uh, come out just Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. That was on Red the other day. They're just, yeah, yeah. Everybody's got to have a language. It's crazy, like, exactly. <laughs> You've got to have your own programming language, right? Um, I guess it, it sort of begs the question as, um, you know, why, right? Why build on a programming language? What is the point? What are we doing up at the university? It's a total waste of time. <laughs> blah, 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 blah. There's been some really good rants on Reddit, actually, about academia, but I won't get too sorry about that. Um, and it's actually a pretty good question, and I hope I've got at least an answer to that question. Um, I'm not necessarily hoping my language is going to be widely famous or anything like that. Of course, that'd be nice, but it, it, I wanted to do something very specific, and I think that specific thing is quite useful. Um, anyway, okay, so, so here's a simple piece of code, okay? Um, it basically iterates through a list of bytecodes, um, and it just picks out a label. And all I'm actually doing is building up a map of labels um, to their offsets in the list, okay? Not too, not too much. Um, it's the Java code. I don't know, it's kind of verbose. Uh, it works okay, it does the job. Um, Python, right? Now, I, I quite like Python. Python is a, is a nice programming language. There's lots of cool things about Python. Um, and if we look at Python, if we look at Java, same thing. This is much nicer though, right? I mean. Anyone think it's not nicer? Unless you really hate indentation syntax. Maybe. <laughs> I don't know. I, I like indentation syntax. It sort of works quite well for me. It just removes stuff I don't need, um, which is kind of cool. And, you know, I quite like programming in Python, but I don't like it being dynamically typed. Right? I really don't like that. And it's caught me out a few times. Um, I have this, thing, this script up at the university. Um, Nick isn't here, unfortunately. He has been subjected to the script. Um, that compiles, pretty, basically, I run a compiler's course and we take in the students' submissions, it compiles them and then runs them against a whole bunch of tests. And it takes, you know, several hours to go through all the students and all the tests. Um, and I wrote this awesome Python script which did it, and it works. Um, and when it's done all of the tests, it then prints out all the answers, right? Which is fantastic. Um, and of course, being a, I'm not a real expert Python programmer, you know, I've spent a lot more time with Java and C++, um, but one of the things you've got to do in Python is you've got to use the str function, right? To convert an integer, say, into a string before you print it out, using, you know, like to do a append. You guys can count on this? <laughs> oh, anyone? Anyone? Yeah, maybe. Um, so the interesting thing is that it runs for three hours, and then it dies on me because I forgot to put str around my, my number, which is the answer, the score of the student, um, which is really annoying. The compiler could have told me that straight off. It would have saved me three hours. I'm going to rerun the whole thing now, you know? I've got to fix my STR, keep my fingers crossed that I haven't made any other mistakes, right? You know, and off it goes. Um, so I'm, I'm, I really like Python, but I really hate that it's dynamically typed. That's a real problem for me. And, and, you know, I don't want to enter a flame war as to whether it's static timing, dynamic timing, blah, blah, blah. But for me, I don't like it. So, um, so Wiley. I suppose one of the things about Wiley is it's kind of like Java, but it looks like Python, which hopefully is kind of nice. Um, and it's completely statically typed. It's not dynamically typed at all. Um, and uh, so this is kind of what it looks like. This is the same piece of program. Um, uh, the slightly odd notation for defining labels, that's an empty map, okay? Interesting. Um, we've got uh, IDX, my variable there. Um, and I'm just iterating over my list of bytecodes. The list is denoted with a square bracket. 
Um, and then if I've got if B is label, um, then I can use B.name. And you actually notice here, first off, B.name is a field of the label uh, type. And if you look in the Java version, we had to do this really exciting thing that I love doing all the time so much, which is I had to cast my bytecode into a bytecode.label before I could access the name field. Whereas in Wiley, um, I can go straight into the name field. It'll automatically retype that for me. Um, so now, at this point here, B has got type bytecode.label, not just type bytecode. Um, so just a few little things. Um, you also know, sorry. Is that uh, because of the no. F, FB is label? Is that what causes that? Yeah, exactly right. Okay. That's exactly right. So, so type testing automatically retypes variables, right? It just makes sense to me. Um, why, you know, because the, the number of times I've written a cast after an instance of test, it just makes me sick. I just hate writing them. I get annoyed. <laughs> um, physically, it makes me feel bad. Um, so I kind of put that in. Um, and one of the things you want to notice, I don't declare any of my variables, okay? The variables are declared by assignment. Uh, and so, for example, the IDX variable has got an um, integer type because it's assigned an integer, okay? Um, and again, it just, it just saves on stuff to write. You know, I like to save on things to write, I guess. So yeah, yeah. And I was going to say, please ask questions as we go along. Right? I think interactive is definitely better than non-interactive. So do you have bite-sized literals? or Bite-sized literals, how do you mean? So that if you want an index to be byte, rather than... Uh, right, good question. OK. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So I made an interesting choice in one sorry. Uh, we can do this. This is obviously not going to compile anymore, OK? Um, you see, I really hate that bytes in Java are numbers. Right? It seems yeah. kind of weird. But you've got to make a choice. Is a byte type an unsigned int, or is it a signed int, like Java? Right? Does that even really make sense? I find it very confusing. So the answer to your question is yes. However, it might not be as you expect. So I could type something like this. That would be a byte in YD. Um, and whatever, you know, it's four bits and two zeros. Um, it's not a number. I can convert it to a number, sure. Uh, I can convert it to an unsigned number or a signed number, whatever I want to do. Yeah, yeah, okay. But by itself, it's not a number. Um, and, and at this point now, index would have type byte. Or I could, oh, hang on, right. Or I could also do something like this, you know, uh, character literal. Now it's got type char. I mean, in fact, that yeah. is a, there's a JVM char and so on. So, yeah, yeah. Um, I made some interesting choices, some of which we'll have to see. Okay. Anyway, cool. Um, and I guess the one thing I should say, and we'll come to this, is uh, the whole point, or well, one of the big points of Wiley is that it's amenable to program verification, um, which is basically like static checking on steroids. Uh, and uh, I think it's, that's kind of useful, but it's important to understand because it affects quite a few of the design decisions that I've made in the language, um, which we will see. So a few more on the data types, we've seen some of these already. Integers are unbounded, so you can't overflow an integer, right? Integer overflow is impossible. Um, rationals, oh, if you like real numbers, there's no floating point. Um, so a real number is actually a rational, and it's an unbounded rational. So I can represent any rational num number, which means I can represent essentially any floating point number and a whole lot more stuff. Um, and one of the reasons for that is because it does make verification much, much easier. You don't have to worry about rounding and lots of icky problems. Um, but I also just personally prefer it. If you, you know, if you, if you go out on the web and you talk to people who work in finance and stuff, they're all using big decimal routinely anyway. Um, a lot of people recommend that you use big decimal over floating point. I actually think floating point is a bit of a weird, weird thing. I don't know what you guys have any strong feelings about it, but. I don't know the situations in which you really would use it because the kinds, of, you know, the, the kinds of errors that can arise, or the margin of errors, are very difficult to understand, at least for me anyway. Um, but there are definite questions here about how to how to implement it efficiently, um, and I've got some answers to that as well. So in many cases, ints should compile that to actual ints on the JVM. That's my plan. Um, lists, and we've got sets, and we've got maps as well as we've seen with square brackets. Um, we've got records. Okay, which is sort of like uh, objects, maybe objects in JavaScript more than in Java, um, where I've got fields and so on with the types. Um, so, Dave, what's, what's, what's big rational? Big rational, oh, I made it. Okay. It's <laughs> I, I, uh, it is uh, essentially a big integer over a big integer. Okay. Uh, 
That's how I think about it. Right? Yeah. So, um, you know, you can represent numbers like 103 that you can't represent using a big decimal, for example. Um, and in fact, in most of my experiments, um, big rational is actually much quicker than big decimal, in fact. Um, which really surprised me, but it's kind of looks out. Um, so you can, you know, you can represent any decimal number um, with arbitrary precision, plus lots of numbers that you can't represent in decimals, which can only be represented as rationals. So it seems like a win, and it's faster. I mean, it's like a win. <laughs> <laughs> even for addition, uh, I think so. I mean, I think it depends on the size of the numbers, um, because the rational is quite nice. You can have quite a large number in principle, but it becomes quite a small rational once you've done all the factoring. Um, whereas a big decimal end up with quite a canon with a lot of space taken up. Um, so, so if you want to represent an arbitrary uh, decimal number, yep. you like say it's less than one. You you basically take the number of digits yep. and turn that into an uh, an integer and then divide by one zero 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 zero. Yep. There you go. That's it. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so it gives you everything that you can want, essentially. Um, what might be nice would be a sort of clean way to sort of always get the decimal <coughs> version of a rational. So like if it's 1 over 3, uh, to be able to get, you know, 0.333 after the number of decimal places, something like that. Um, it's probably something I can put in the standard library, which would be quite easy. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Mm. So the idea is. I, you know, there are still questions about how to make it go fast. It's never going to be as fast as by the point. So, some questions there. But if you're already using big decimal, then it, it's not it's not going to be slower than that. That's for sure. Uh, okay. So the verification stuff, um, which is I guess the main thing that Wiley's about, um, is basically trying to write three post conditions and have them checked at compile time. And that's really what I'm, I'm keen on. Um, and I'm not going to show it today, but, but maybe for those of you who do come to the exceptional workshop, I could show a demo of this. I've got quite a nice demo that actually works, and uh, it's kind of fun. Oh, there's even a YouTube video as well, which is really exciting. Um, it's a bit weird because it's me talking. Ah, enter numbers, and oh, look, it doesn't compile. It's a bit weird. I haven't made many videos before. Um, uh, so we can see it up here, okay? So this is a sum, right? There's two, I've dropped two versions of the same bit of code, essentially. So we start with the top one. I'm summing over a list of integers, and I've got a requires clause, which is the precondition, and an ensures clause, which is the postcondition, okay? Um, and uh, in fact, that's actually a mistake. I this group has to see, that's why I was late, because I was just rushing too much. Here we go, put that like that. There we go, that makes more sense. Um, so um, basically what it says is there is no x in the list, the parameter list, um, where that where x is less than zero. So everything in the list is a positive, is zero or greater, essentially. Okay? Um, and uh, it's ensuring that the dollar, which is the return value in this case, okay, is greater than or equal to zero. Right? And, and we kind of know that because if we start with zero and we always add a positive number, well we're always going to get a positive number, right? Um, and so the idea is that the compiler then checks, well, this is actually true. And, um, you know, we can be more precise in what we write in our programs and, and sort of uh, detail the invariants that are sort of buried in our, you know, at the moment in Java programs and so on, actually explicitly in the program. And, and the compiler will tell us when it's right or wrong. That's my goal. And I think, you know, in terms of why I build a programming language, if I can build a programming language where this works, it doesn't matter if the programming language is good or bad. I don't think it matters because basically there is no programming language where this works. So if I actually make it work, that'll be something of note. I can write a Wikipedia page and you know at least have a little bit of history. And people can say, oh, back in the day there was this crazy programming language called Wiley. You know, da 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 da. Um, and, and now it's completely died out. But you know it was really good at the time. <laughs> Who knows? Um, and you can do other things as well. So not just for pre and post conditions. You can do it on data types as well. So here. I'm defining the type natural, which is an integer which is always greater than or equal to zero. Okay, so dollar is a bit like this actually. Sort of it refers to the value that's going into my type. I almost think about changing dollar with this, almost maybe. Um, and then I've got a natural list, which is literally just a list of natural numbers. And so the, the natural list is the same as my list up there with the requires clause. So I can just pass in, oh I've missed my bracket there. I can just pass in my natural list just like that. And that's exactly the same as what I had up here. Um, and I suppose what I should be doing is returning a mat there. 
Because otherwise, it's not, it's not, doesn't have the insurers. Yeah, exactly. It won't know that, right? You've got it. You've got it. You've got it. See, there you go. Um, yeah, that's, so this is exactly you can listen. equivalent to that. You could you can lessen the the constraint. Oh, you, right? you, could, you, you could relax it. You could say, you know, yeah. since since yeah. since it is in that, then it will be an int. Yeah, yeah, you could absolutely. Uh, but essentially, what I'm trying to show here is that that you, you know you don't have to have lots of pre and post conditions. But I think if you write your data types quite carefully, you'll actually end up with things that look like this, and that will actually work much better. That's really what I'm trying to do. Um, and you know, the compiler will actually take this and expand it into that for you automatically, so you don't have to worry about it. Okay, so that's again, currently, uh, if you download the compiler, um, the pre and post conditions are only checked at runtime. Okay, so um, the compile time stuff is very much a work in progress. Okay, cool. So that's constraints, it's one side of it. I'm not going to talk too much about that today, actually. Um, I am going to talk a bit more about this uh, flow sensitive typing and some of the interesting aspects of the type system in Wiley. Um, well, I say type system, just types. So I use that horrible word about like type system. Um, so this is just a this is an example that I've got a benchmark, which is just a calculator, it's just it evaluates expressions and reduces them to numbers. Um, and so we've got like a binary operator here, okay, which would be maybe plus or minus or multiplication. Um, we've got a constant int, a constant, uh, and we've got uh, variables as well. And we've got this map n, which is the environment, which maps variables to the value in the environment. So when we see a variable in our expression, we take it out of the environment and just pop it in to the expression. All right? um, and so we kind of see the flow sensor typing, which we have, we have seen already. But um, you know, at each point, I'm retyping my variables so that I know exactly what they are. So here, you know, I've got the left-hand side, I've got the right-hand side, because the bin op type has got a left-hand side and a right-hand side. And likewise, with my variable, um, I've got an ID field, because the variable has got the ID field. Um, and it really does save you quite a lot of um, uh, hassle in casting and that kind of stuff. Um, and ultimately, what I would like to do would be able to turn that into a switch statement so I can switch on types. I can't remember if somebody asked me about that. Um, that would be my goal because that would make it even nicer. Um, of course, on the JVM, we we'll just compile that to if statements, but that was you know, by the by. Um, and another point here is variables can actually have different types at different points. So it's not quite the same as something like C sharp, um, where the first assignment dictates the type, and that type is then fixed for the whole life of the variable. Um, I can actually um, do something weird, like let's, let's go and jump in here. Um, I can do something like this. I could go uh, E equals, you know, let's take another byte, okay? Right, at this point. And that's fine. And up here, E is one of my expressions, a bin off expression. And right after this, E is now just a byte, which is not a big deal, yeah, fair enough. But if you use temporary variables and you end up with temp1, temp2, temp3, temp4, I kind of think it helps a little bit in that space. Uh, no, I'm sure. You don't think that's the kind of thing that you'd want your compiler to, to complain about? No. Like to tell you you might have screwed something up with that? Well, the thing about it, right, is that I already have to face the, the reality that my variables can have different types of different points, right? Because here, E has got a type before that, which is just the general expression, and afterwards here, now it's got the type of binary operator. Um, and that's, that's like uh, well, no, no. Though, yeah, like you're right. I, I, this is a bit more radical. Yeah. And that depends how you d describe the semantics of it. Because another way of doing the semantics of that is that, in that, if E is something, that in fact, within inside the scope of that, there's another variable E that's that type. And it, and it shadows or hides the, that E that's outside. Yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, given the way that it works, so we're going to see this value semantic stuff that Wiley does, that would effectively be the same thing as what it does already. Um, I, I agree with what you're saying, that you could just go for narrowing, uh, but there are some cool reasons why not. So are there any limitations to the new type you can assign? Like if it starts off as being declared essentially a string, can you assign an integer into it? Yep. Right. And what it means, it means some cool stuff, so I'll show you. I quite like it actually, so hang on a second. Let's, uh, does that show me? No, it doesn't. Let's, let's just go back. This is a bit, my kill list here, get a bit bigger. Here we go. Okay, so I can do something weird. And this is the kind of stuff you do do in Java quite a lot, or at least I do. Um, if something like that, da, 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 da. let's go, I'm going to have um, ls equals, uh, let's say, int here. Okay, not uh, one, two, three. Else. Uh, let's 
devastating knowledge and so forth. And at this point, Alice has now got type int or null, right? So, um, so I can define it on either side of the branch, and afterwards, it will then bring the two options that you've defined together to make a bigger type. So we're sort of going in the opposite direction there. Um, and I think that's quite nice. In fact, it's actually, a, if I didn't support that, I'd have to support some kind of declaration, because otherwise I've got no way to sort of use Ellis. I have to declare Ellis before the, the if condition if I wanted to use it here, if I didn't support this kind of thing. Does that make sense? Kind of, yeah. So, interesting question. Is it a good idea or a bad idea? Yeah, we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, I'm not constrained, man. I'm just basically, it's just my brain. It going, depends on whether the number of times like you do this. that well, intentionally see, exceeds the number of times you do it accidentally. A sensible, <laughs> another alternative yeah. approach, which might be sensible, yeah. would be to have it take on the type from its first assignment and never be able to change that. But which would be the first assignment in that example, you see? That would be the thing. <laughs> Yeah, the, you would, the compiler would have to say that the type has to be the same. That all of the potential assignments have to yeah, be the same type. Yeah, you could. Then I, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, but I have a problem. How do I then create something that could be in a list or not? Right. You know, if this is, you know, if I'm coming from a dynamically typed sort of perspective, I can do this. This is not a problem. And it, and I want my types to be almost as flexible as dynamically typed. Um, and in fact, I did actually rule one possibility out. Right, so um, I had this idea, which I implemented. So let's do it something like this: um, x x is five, okay, or four. Um, so it's making a record with x. And so, of course, in JavaScript or something, you could go something like this, right? Okay, uh, you know, return e or whatever. All right. So now I've just created a new field y. Okay. Now I thought about that, and I could support that, right? That would work. Um, but I did decide that was bad. That really was pushing them too much because you know you might be trying to assign to a field and just make a typo and create a completely new field and it would be fine. Yes, just, I curse Python for that frequently. <laughs> right. So that was a bridge too far for me. That's, uh, that's totally the same, same argument for your variables. So you can have e one and e l and there. You can, but at least they're all typed. So if if you try to put it into something and it's got the wrong type, at least the compiler will tell you at that point. That makes sense. So if I assign e you know, uh, I, I guess, uh, you know, I guess what you mean. You mean if I, if I wanted, if I had e1 and e2, and I had one as an integer, and then I signed, I wanted to assign e2, a new integer, but I created e1, or overwrote e1 by accident, or something like that. Yeah, or yeah. what's that e1 and el, and that, so that actually looks the same. Yeah. But they're, they're, they're different. Yeah. Things. Yeah, that's fair. That is fair. So it is a bit iffy at that point. Um, I just going, I'm just trying to go radical yeah, sure, sure. on bringing it down. Anyway, so that's one of the things, this flow sensitive typing thing, which I think is quite neat. And certainly, there aren't many programming languages that have this. You will notice a, a lot of new programming languages support type inference, um, and it's really popular to support type inference. So this is kind of like the next logical step from type inference. That's how I look at it, because it's even better. Anyway, anyway let's, let's bring it on. We've got more, more to see, more to see, more to see. Okay, so that's one thing. Maybe you don't like that. Mm, okay. Let's see what we make of this. So this is the union types. <laughs> Which is similar to what we we're just looking at, but I think it's really cool. So, um, you know, null pointer exceptions are, you know, uh, the most widely, most common kind of error in Java programs. Um, Tony Hoare, you know, FRS, whatever, um, reckons they cost the industry over a billion dollars since he created them. Um, I don't know. If, well, he reckons he created them. I, I guess I'll take his word for it. Um, <laughs> one day he was like, "Oh yeah, null references, wicked. Let's do it." <laughs> So they won't say that. So it's so. What happens is there are no. There's no. Uh, sort of. You can't assign null to anything, right? If you want something to be null, you've got to say it can be null, and that's it. Uh, so in this case, I've got. I'm returning something that can be null or an integer, right? Um, and if I didn't have null there, there's absolutely no way it could be null. There's no confusion. You know, like in Java, there's confusion because you've got a reference and it can be null. Oh, huh, who thought of that? That doesn't actually make sense, right? Why allow that? Um, so to me, I think, well, I'm going to split those two things out, have proper union types, um, and, and I quite like it. And so what it means is when I use that index of method here, right, I get IDX back, and now it's a null or an integer, but I don't know which. 
And the type system will not let me treat it as an integer until I'm sure it is an integer. And so I have to go, if i the x is int, now I can use it, no problem. Otherwise, it's not. And I'll do whatever it is I'm going to do at that point. All right. um, and, you know, I think that's quite cool. Mm. Mm. Right. And again, that's, that's related to the flow sensitive typing because I'm using it here to split out the different cases. It's a little bit like option types in Scala. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I don't know what, I'm not really sure what the big difference is between them. I think my kind of types are a bit more flexible. I think that's the major difference. Um, yeah. so, so can you say if, if IDH is null in that case? Yep, could do. Um, you can do you can do stuff like if IDX does not equal null as well, that actually works. Um, or you can if you wanted it if you wanted to catch the null case explicitly, if IDX is null, yep, that'll take you into the null the null side. No so is it smart enough to recognize that if you say if IDX does not equal to null, yes. it recognizes that you're saying it's not a null type. Yeah. And that it is an integer in that case. And it, it actually the compiler at the front end translates that into if not IDX is null. So it yeah. translates yeah. it into an actual type test. So does it then know that if you've taken the null part out of the union type, yep. all that's left is the int? Absolutely. Yep, absolutely. So there's no problem using it there. Null point exception, not possible. Yeah. And, it, and it will do that in a situation where you've got um, subtypes and supertypes and you've got a function of union yep, type. Yep. Yep. Lots of different situations yep. going on, you can do that. Yep. And the union doesn't have to be just two, can it be more? It can, yep. Wow. Uh, so in the calculator example, my expressions are a union of binary operators, variables, constants. I think I've got lists right. as well. Either. Yeah, yeah. Right. Anything. Anything. Well, that sounds like it's very powerful, doesn't so it? So it's kind of cool. Yeah, it is kind of cool. It, it, a bit tricky to make it work properly, though. <laughs> <laughs> Apart from that minor technical detail, you know. Um, yeah. Anything else? I think all. Yeah. Oh. Um, yeah. You, you presensitized me by showing at the very first the Java and the Python. Yeah. And I looked at it and I said, oh, I've been doing some work recently with Python. And no, in fact, that's not the standard idiom that they use. They don't say, they, they discourage you from actually looking at the type right. of a variable. They suggest you should use his instance. OK. OK. Yep. Why? Because the type of the variable may not be what you're looking for, it may be a derived class. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Yeah. And so uh, it won't match the name. So you've got to be careful. Yeah. So, but if you say is instance, well then the derived class will match it. Yeah, so I don't have any way to say, oh, I guess you could do it. You could say is an instance of something, but not an instance of something sort of deeper in the hierarchy, for example. Well, for instance, if IDX was NAT, yep. is IDX int? Yes. OK. In, in Python, it wouldn't be. But you would use is instance, and you would say, ah, is, is IDX a natural, an instance of int? And it would say yes. Because it's a derived class for so your is operator is, um, is actually instance of. It's it, it could be exactly that type or any subtypes. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So there's an issue there as to whether or not I want a special operator to catch the sort of exact type. Exact case, yeah. That's an interesting question. I actually thought about that. But wouldn't you just do that by prefix? Wouldn't you just check for Mac before you check for it? You could do yeah. I mean there's ways you could do it and you could you could do something like um, if IDX is uh, int and not nat or something like that, you know, you could but somebody else might come along with exactly rational or no, some yes. other sort of ints that aren't nat. Yeah. So, so yes, that's an interesting point. Yeah, and, and it, the big issue is not in your own code. The big issue is when you're integrating your stuff with someone else, and yeah. they've taken something, you know, some class that you've yeah. been working with and extended it. And now they give you an instance of that extension. Is it is it sufficiently like your class to be what you intended? If they're calling your routine, it ought to be. Right. So you get, I think we so so let's 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 move on because I think the next thing has some kind of I'm not sure if it's a good or a bad um, reflection of what you just said actually because in fact typing is weird in YB as well, right? Um, 
because I want it to be as flexible as possible. I, in some ways, I do want it to be like a dynamic type language, because I think dynamic type languages have got a lot to offer us, and, and the fact that people really like them is telling us that, that languages like Java are too restrictive, and we want to open it up. So I've opened it up in Wiley, um, and in fact, um, in the academic world, the name, what we'd say is that Wiley has structural types, not nominal types, okay? What does that mean? Well, what it basically means is that um, you can think of my types as being macros, maybe one way to think about it, right? They're not names, right? Linked list doesn't exist. Linked list is nothing. Linked list is just a macro, and whatever you see, linked list, wham, you slam in the actual type, okay? So I can define, you know, Dave's wacky list. If it's got the same stuff that a linked list has, then I can chuck Dave's wacky list in wherever a linked list is needed, you know? And so you get um, implicit subtyping. I don't have to declare that Dave's wacky list is a subtype of linked list. If it's got the right stuff, it already is a subtype. And that's pretty much it. So I could, I could do something like this, actually. Let's have a look. Uh, let's not call it Dave's wacky well, list. You could, you could be, in fact, constructing it. Um, and if you construct it so that it looks the same, it is the same. You don't, it's not strictly derived from. Yeah. But it's... Um, sort of, it's a little bit like duct typing, but it's actually type checked, right? In the sense that you've got to have the right stuff. It's got to be the right types, otherwise it's not going to go together. So in this case, I've got a wacky list. Well, a wacky list um, cannot be null. So it's a list with at least one element, essentially. Uh, maybe non empty list would be a better name, in fact. Um, but wherever I've got a linked list, I can pass a wacky list in if I want to. There's no problem there. If it said wacky list as int that wacky list next, would it match? I'd be in trouble. Because <laughs> I wouldn't be able to build one. You need the null to terminate it. That makes sense. <laughs> it's ah, just an infinite type. Right. Okay. <laughs> But yes, in principle, yes, I could do, there are some things I could do. Uh, oh, hang on, wait a second. Uh, so in my, yeah, actually, I do want to do that. So if, let's say I chuck something else in here like this, okay? I'm getting a bit slightly off, but let's just see so if we can get a bit bigger. Um, okay, and then I have null or that, and I go wacky list, like this, which is really what your question is. The answer is, yup, that's fine. No problem. Wacky list can go in instead of linked list. And it basically is a linked list, except it can't be an int. So that's the difference. It's a special kind of linked list. It's clearly a subtype of linked list. It is a linked list, except it cannot be an int. It cannot be a constant. Right? But I don't have to say that. And they don't have to be in the same file. They can be in separate files. Um, you know, they can be, one can be in the library, one can be somewhere else. You know, there are times in Java language where you need to kind of prohibit that sort of ability. Like, for example, the string class in Java is marked as final, so it means yep. you can't go and override any of its methods. Um, I, you probably see where I'm going with this. You know, the typical example they give is that you can subclass string and change some method to do something really, really different to what the rest of the um, yes. Language is relying on. So the answer is yes, but that wouldn't affect people who are already using the constraint in Wiley, at least. Um, it would mean, I suppose, in a sense, that I could chuck that thing into a method that was expecting a string. It might behave differently, perhaps. Yeah. But uh, maybe that's okay. Maybe that's not okay. Um, and you will also be able to do things like make things. Uh, what's the right way to do this? Uh, so I'm going to. My syntax is a bit iffy on this, but this is kind of the thing, right? So I'm going. To, so my syntax looks like this. Uh, I thought about private, so I could write private, and that means basically what you'd expect, which is you can't see linked list; it doesn't exist, right? And so protected and widely, and this is, shall we say, you know, being figured out. Uh, what protected means is well, you can see the name weapons, but you can't see anything else. So you can hide the details of the wacky list, which then is very comparable to what you can do in Java, if you want to do that. Um, and it's a little unclear to me how it's going to play out. I suspect what will happen is that within packages, you'll know the contents of types, and you'll be able to do arbitrary subtyping as you want to. But when you release like libraries and stuff, 
who make a lot of it private, um, unless there's a good reason not to, or not private, but protected, unless there's a good reason not to, to prevent, you know, things like people arbitrary changing invariants or something weird, you know. Doesn't that just destroy the type of thing you can do when you're calling libraries? It, it, it constrains it in the sense of, uh, I don't know what it is, so I can't pass it in to someone that's looking for a link list, for example, because I don't know if it is a link list. But in that sense, it does constrain it. It means that in order to create a wacky list, everything has to be done through the library that declared it. I have to have a constructor. I get this type back, but I don't know what it is. Um, some interesting questions of whether or not I could do type testing to then recover the structure. I guess, in theory, the way my compiler works, that would be possible. I don't know if that's a good idea. Yeah. Some question marks there. Quite a lot of questions, you know. I mean, like, the idea is to build it and just see what happens. If it's any good, if it's not any good, then, eh, well, you know, hey, could be worse. Yeah. Anyway, all right. Cool. So that's kind of the idea. So the structural type, subtyping stuff is kind of weird. Um, I think it's really neat, actually, um, and and it's much like JavaScript. So if we look at how I might construct one of these things, well, this is this is one way. Very pulled off JavaScript essentially. Um, I'm just saying I've got a, a, a you know, the one is my value for the field data, next is just null, here's my li uh, list, of, as you can see I've already written it, um, and I've got data type two now, and then next is pointing to the other link. So this has got two links in it, one with two and one with one, and these are the types of them, okay? Um, and so that's the type there, and then this is the type for the longer list, and then I can pass that into sum, and it works, no problem. Um, so lots of interesting questions here about things like error messages and how to handle error messages, and I have some ideas on that. Um, because it already happens to me that I see massive C++ style error messages with <laughs> this kind of gunk all over the place, like big gunk everywhere. Um, and that needs to be addressed. Um, I, I think it was a pretty good answer for that, actually. Yeah. Cool. All righty. So that's structural subtopic. Okay, so now the next one. Okay, so we've got sort of, you know, three, well, if you include the constraints, four big things in Wiley. Flow sensitive, uh, structural subtyping, and value semantics, right? Um, and the value semantics uh, seems to cause people some problems. Um, I've had people say things like, you cannot have a, a decent programming language that doesn't have references. Um, and lots of things like, it'll never be efficient, it's totally crazy. Um, uh, I don't think any of these things are true. And actually, I think there are lots of really, really good reasons to not have references, okay? So basically, in Wiley, everything's passed by value, right? You can, there's no aliasing, there's no pointing to something else. Um, you know, there's no modifying a list in a method and it modifies the caller somehow magically. It's, it just doesn't happen, right? There's no point in climbing lists because lists are always climbed, effectively, right? Um, and so, you know, if we look at this as well, this is taken from my chess um, benchmark. Um, and all it's doing is it's applying a move, uh, given a move, onto the board. So, it's a, so, you know, the move could be, I don't know, pawn to k4 or something, right? Um, and so I want to take the board, I want to update the board to produce the new board with a pawn at k4, right? Um, now, in Java, you might, you know, I, I would probably do this by having um, apply move return void. And I'll just update the board in place, right? I don't know if you guys would do that or not, maybe you would. Um, and so I take the board and I just literally say, okay, uh, this pawn is no longer in this cell, this array location, whatever. I'm now putting it into the one represented K4. And then whoever called apply move, what they pass in as a reference would then be updated, right? Uh, sound reasonable? Yeah. Uh, and why that just doesn't make sense. If I make apply move void, then it's basically just one big no operation. Um, so what I've got to do is I've got to return the new board. I've got to take the board, update it, and then return it. Right? So it's, it's like a, a functional programming language, if you program in functional programming language. Um, and so here we can see uh, end board is my new board, and I've got this dispatch thing which basically deals with all the different kinds of moves, and it produces a new board with the updated state, and I then return that. Okay? Um, and that's the only way that you can get information out of methods is through return values. There, you know, there is no alias, so that's the only way it works. And it's, I guess it's kind of a bit of a radical departure from Java, certainly from imperative programming languages. It does really require a bit of a different way of thinking. Um, one of the things that I borrowed from Python, I guess, is a destructuring assignment. 
so that I can part, I can return tuples, and then I can do things like x comma y equals something. It helps me to pass the state around quite nicely, um, and so on. Yeah. So yeah, I don't know if you guys does that sound like a bad idea? Who likes to clone all their things when they go into constructors? Any defensive cloners here? Copiers? Yes, good man. Me too. You should see my compiler, right? Every constructor <laughs> take in, you know, I have a rule that says I don't take in the list. If I want to pass in a collection to a constructor, I make the type collection. Because I can't do anything with it. I have to clone it into an array list or whatever it's going to do. Because um, it just makes my life better. The number of bugs I've had where I've been modifying something by accident because two things are pointing to something. <laughs> living nightmare. Right? Um, this problem doesn't happen in Wiley. It just doesn't happen. Not physically possible. Um, and actually, let's before we go on to the boring stuff, let's go to digression. Those of you who are familiar with effective Java, and actually I was looking on the web, uh, for some reason my book says item 24, but I think maybe the second edition says a different item. Anyway, um, item 24, effective Java, um, Josh Block says, make defensive copies when needed. Um, and a quote from him, it is essential to make a defensive copy of each immutable parameter to the constructor. Essential, right? And I was really psyched to find this because I've been doing this and admittedly, I had read Effective Java, but I'd forgotten. Uh, or maybe I skipped over this part. I can't and I look back and I was like, oh yeah, I do that all the time. It makes heaps of sense. This is totally right. You know? um, and if you do that a lot already, then what it means is you're actually cloning your data structures a lot anyway. So the potential overheads of value semantics start to become somewhat um, uh, sort of moot, if you like. Um, and in fact, we can do better. We actually can be even faster. So I use reference counting. Um, in the Wiley compiler. Um, so basically what reference counting means is, well, I mean, it's kind of obvious, I, I keep a, a reference to every list and I know the reference count. So if I pass the list into a method, so here's my apply move, um, I've sort of changed it a little bit, and I'm going, oh dear, I've really changed it, I don't know, broken it, uh, going into <laughs> apply simple, that's what it's supposed to do, I've changed it, update to apply simple, make more sense. Um, so I'm passing forward, into to apply simple, and here's my board, and then I'm updating board, and then I'm returning board. Okay, seems kind of logical. Now the thing about value semantics is what value semantics essentially says is I've got to copy B here completely, pass it into apply simple, then when I make the assignment, I may have to copy it again, and again, and then I return the new one. Okay, um, and that's, it's just ridiculous. I mean, that's incredibly inefficient. Um, Fortunately, we don't have to do that. Using reference counting, it'll basically say, okay, I'm passing B into here, I'm passing B um, in by simple. When I update it, what's the reference count? Oh, the reference count is one. Cool, we can just do an in-place update. Right? And then we'll just then do the in-place update. Um, and then we'll do the second one. What's the reference count on the second one? Oh, look, it's, it's one still, because no one's actually you know, done anything with it. So we can do an in-place update again, and we can pass the board back as a return value, and it's actually exactly the same data structure that came in. I haven't copied it a single time through this whole thing. Um, and it's kind of, as soon as you start to think like that, you start to think, hey, that's kind of cool, because if I do defensive copying, I end up in this, this real nightmare. I hate, I hate Java, sorry, I should say that, Jay. Nightmare of, should I defensively clone it? Because if I defensively clone it in the constructor, it means I'm going to clone it every single time that constructor's called. Even if, and I do this, I'm passing in a new list into that thing. I will create a new list, pass it in, and then I'll clone it again. Yay! And that's because I don't know who's going to use my constructor, so I've got to be defensive. I mean, that's what defensive planning is. Um, but in Wiley, Wiley's really clever because I pass it in, you see, and if no one else is using it, it's got a reference count of one. It doesn't get cloned. So I actually win. This actually makes my code faster, in principle, he says. Should so, so um, if you can, if you don't have references, how does the reference count get more than one? Yeah, that's just what I was wondering. <laughs> uh, okay, so uh, <laughs> yeah, so it's not get, so at the end, the heart of it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Has nothing no, 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 no. So the thing is, when I mean reference counting, what I mean is the implementation on the JVM passes everything by reference yeah. and maintains knowledge of the reference. Right. Count. So whenever you, for example, whenever I put B here. If, if I'm, let's say I imagine I'm using B later on down here for something else, 
then when I put B onto the stack to go into here, then it's going to increment the reference count. Right? Um, and so if I'm using B down here, and I'm passing B here, then it's going to have a higher reference count. Oh, so they're actually on the stack, so as they pass down, the reference count goes up. Yeah, yeah. essentially. That's roughly how it works, yeah. Yeah, Wiley has a, a bytecode intermediate language, a little bit like Java bytecode. Uh, so, yeah, anyway. So that's the answer. It's, it's an, like, the reference counting is an implementation issue to make it go fast. Um, and it's quite effective, actually. I should show you. So this is why I was late, because I was trying to put this data in. And I didn't manage to get it all in. I've actually got another whole bunch of data points now. I was already late, so like, it, was, you know, it was a bad idea to start with, anyway. Um, here's the benchmarks that I implemented in Wiley. Um, the gun zip benchmark is an implementation of the deflate protocol. Anyone implemented deflate here? RFC 1951. Very exciting read. <laughs> really riveting. Um, nice and cryptic. Took me a while. I had this awesome bug as well that I tweeted about. A few people commented on. Um, I had this bug with, the, uh, with my algorithm. It was decompressing stuff quite nicely, but then at some point it was just becoming complete garbage. And I just couldn't figure this out. And I've been debugging it for two, two plus hours. I mean, it's probably two to three hours at least. Um, and I realized that what I was actually trying to do was to pack a 13-bit number into a byte. Right? That's obviously not going to work, of course. And the beauty of it, of course, is that most of the time actually it does work because most of the numbers weren't that big. But every so often, one of them would be too big. Bang. Um, so what I did was I wrote a precondition onto the method that the integer parameter coming in must be between 0 and 255, right? Suddenly, bang, immediately, it told me where the problem was in my code. <laughs> three hours later, you know, it took me three hours to get to that point, and if, at the beginning, I'd actually used the system, you know, used my own system, it would have saved me a bit of time. So that was kind of interesting. Um, Okay, anyway, uh, so these benchmarks. So we've got deflate protocol, uh, that's guns it. Jasm, that's um, a bytecode disassembler in Wiley. Um, chess is just a, a basically validates chess games in short algebraic notation. Um, and I run it through the longest chess game of all time. Um, calculator is the expression calculator, which we sort of saw a bit of it earlier. And SCC, anyone heard of Tarjan's algorithm for finding strongly connected components? No, don't worry too much about it. It's a director graph algorithm thingy. I just happen to like that one. Um, and uh, they're not that big programs. I mean, JASM's the biggest. Um, and the guns, it, it only does the decompression. Um, and it doesn't do compression or anything like that. So I, I will make those benchmarks bigger, probably. Um, and so what, what I basically did is I ran this code over the sort of sample inputs. Um, like guns, it, the input is RFC uh, 1951 compressed. Um, I thought it was quite nice. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, and I measured the number of clones of my data structures. Right? And so the total number of times that I try to update my data structure in some way, right, which is what we see on the right hand side here, and the number of times that I actually had to take that data structure and actually clone it. Um, and if you look at the numbers, and this is the percentage, the ratio of percentage essentially here, um, they're not bad. Jasm's by far the worst. If you look at Gunzip, only 0.62%, right? I mean, it's hardly had to do any climbing at all. Almost every single update has been done in place, despite the fact that it's got this value semantic stuff, you know? And if you start to think about those kinds of numbers, you start to think, you know, that's, that's not bad, right? That's not too bad. Um, and I went and looked at Jasm. Um, to figure out what's going on. Um, and basically, uh, I have the byte array that you're processing through, and I, I, you have to uh, extract um, uh, sort of supplementary data for each bytecode. So I read the bytecode, decode it, and then extract a bit more data, and I use the sublist operation to extract that data. And the data is only four or five bytes or something like that at most. It sort of varies between one and up to, I don't know, four or five, something like that, doesn't matter. Um, and I use the sublist operation. So the sublist operation is what actually is causing all of those clones. Um, but in fact, because it's such a small number, each clone is only three or four bytes of data. Um, so it actually isn't a significant overhead. It's actually a very minor overhead. And I could have even written it um, without using sublist to avoid those clones, and the numbers would have gone, gone way down. If I wanted to, I just, I just used sublist because that was a natural thing to do. Um, so yeah, so you know, like if you look at the calculator, okay, it is quite a small piece of code, I have to admit. Um, and yes, that reminds me, I did it in Queens. In fact, I should have put that one up here. Anyway, um, you know, not a single clone operation. 
And what that thing does is it, it has expressions, it evaluates expressions. I also have assignment statements as well. So I have things like x equals 1, x equals 2, then print x plus y times 2. And I have these big randomly generated expressions with hundreds of uh, nodes in them um, and a whole sequence of them. Not a single clone through the whole thing. And I didn't try it. I'm not trying. I wrote these benchmarks and then did the measurements. I didn't try to write them specifically to get the measurements down. Right? I mean, if I had, I would have changed JASM straight out of that. Um, you know, because I can fix that in a nanosecond if I want. Um, so, you know, that tells me that I reckon value semantics is pretty good. All right. Does that mean you've got something in your language, like maybe a little warning on sublist to say this could be expensive? Yeah, well, um, so, I mean, the thing is, in, in that case, what actually isn't that expensive, because it's such a small amount of data, um, yeah, there, I guess there are some questions there. Um, and in fact, I was thinking about what data structure I might like. So in fact, if I had a, if, if a list with um, an end and a start position was my default data structure, that would actually help me quite a lot. Because at the moment, I'm create, if I take off the front, I have to create a whole new list because I've got no way to advance that pointer easily. But if I had, if you like, doubly ended lists, then I could just do an in-place update by just moving that the front pointer up, and that would save me quite a lot. So I, I think I could do better. Um, but yeah, it's a fair call, certainly if it comes, if it turns out to be an issue, yeah. Uh, as long as it goes uh, slice or array. Sorry? Go into the slice part. Yeah. It's like part of an array. Yeah, that's, oh, yeah. I'm sure it was. Yeah, and so does this actually. It has, a sub, has a sub, actually a sub-list in terms of the list. Uh, yeah, so it's actually a different type, isn't it? If that's the idea. Yeah. Yeah, so the, there's some questions there, yeah. And I, have, I don't support things like um, uh, sublisting where you have an increment, that kind of stuff as well. That would make it more complicated, in fact. So, some questions, but still, I think that's encouraging. Pretty encouraging. Um, now, what was I going to talk about? No, it's a so, so, I guess the obvious thing that we do want to think about is the performance. Uh, I must draw your attention to the log scale. Okay. Um, <laughs> I don't want to mislead anyone here. Okay, a lot of, there's the queens one. There's the end queens. Okay. Uh, so what that tells you is that it is a lot slower. Okay. It is a lot slower. I have to admit. Um, most of the reason for that, especially on these benchmarks, is because of unbounded integers. Right. So in the Java version. Right, it says Java, doesn't it? In the Java version, it's just a native int. In my thing, it's a big integer. And that's why it's basically getting killed. Um, and probably in most of them, that's the reason. Like, for example, the sorting, it'll, that'll be the reason. Um, and I'm not sure about some of the other ones, like regex. I'm not sure what's going on there. Uh, so if I can find a way to compile stuff down to native ints in certain cases, and if you remember my constraints, I, I'm allowed to write constraints. So if I, if the user writes a constraint that means I can put it into a native integer, and then it will do that, then in theory, I should be able to bring performance quite a bit down. Um, and certainly, I think, with more optimization, I can bring it quite a bit down. It'll be interesting to see how close it gets. That's for sure. Yeah. Cool. All right? Okie dokie. Uh, ah, Java interoperation, of course. So, now this is... I need some help with this one, because I, I can't decide if this is a good idea or if this is a totally messed up idea. Um, it seems messed up, and it causes Eclipse some problems, or it does work, but it, it got confused the other day, and it took me ages to get it unconfused for no obvious reason. Um, so basically, I want to be able to call, uh, I want to be able to call Java code from Wiley, and vice versa. Okay? Um, so if I want to call out to Java code from Wiley, I need to know what the, the Wiley types of the functions I'm calling is, right? Because Wiley doesn't understand Java types, they have no sense. Unlike things, you know, something like Ruby, where it might make sense, I can't make any sense of Java types. So you have to essentially declare a prototype, like you would in C, or C++, um, which basically gives me the type, but without the body. And I just write it as native. Um, and then what I do is, if you write a Java file, which has got the same module name, but dollar $native, which is technically a valid name in Java, um, then the compiler will automatically redirect anyone trying to call that method into this Java method here. Um, and you'll notice you have to obviously provide the right types. Um, 
you know, that sort of underlie Wiley in order to, to actually do anything useful. I mean, because it's going to literally chuck at you what it's got coming out of the system, out of Wiley code, essentially. Um, and so it'll be things like uh, YJC runtime list, and I'll probably eventually make this something like YJC runtime integer as well, um, and so on. Um, so you can just import what you see runtime to start, and then you have to just list an integer and set and stuff, and it should mostly make sense. Um, and then you can do whatever you want and return, and you'll be fine. And it should work quite well. Um, and it, it's not as efficient, I guess, as you might like. Is that what I'm yeah, right there? Yeah, well, well uh, bear in mind this could be a wrap. I mean, if I was actually... Oh, yeah, or you write a wrap. Yeah, so if I, wanted to write, if I wanted to connect to some existing Java library, I would essentially write a binary, which would have all the prototypes I wanted, and then have a Java file that then redirected into that stuff. But if that's going to happen, why can't Wiley generate that automatically? Um, the thing is, it just... It, I mean, it, it's... Or is it, is it just... Are the type system's just so... Different. ...immissible? Yeah, yeah that's the thing. That, I mean, that, that, that you just can't. It really has to It needs a human brain to do it. It's completely different, but even things like references, I mean, you've got a problem that even a reference doesn't make sense in Wiley, right? So if I've got, you know, if my library returns a reference to something and that reference is important, then I've actually got a problem because I don't know how I'm going to return it from here, right? Because it doesn't even make sense. So, yeah, it, there is an issue there. I can't argue with that. But at least it is possible. That's how I look at it. I'm trying to be optimistic. Um, and also, what you can also do is you can declare, um, I think it's public extern. So if I want to call from Java into Wiley, um, you have to declare it to be extern, and that means it won't use any name mangling. So at the moment, uh, the JVM has a whole lot of name mangling on the function name, which encodes the actual Wiley type. Um, it's a whole list of numbers, essentially. You don't want to have to type that in when you're trying to call it from Java code. So if you declare it as extern, then you can just call it directly. And provided you've got the right objects, then it will just work. Easily. Um, and what that means is you can't overload external methods essentially because this compiler can't implement that in general. What happens if the types are in this example? So you've got an index type there and there's a declaration. Yeah. Presumably the Java method can turn the terminal to null. How does that If this guy returns null, yeah. I don't know what's going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> Bad stuff is going to happen. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, that, that's a problem. Uh, and in some sense, you know, I would need to write a fairly specific tutorial on how to properly interoperate. Because, yeah, stuff like that, it just doesn't make sense, right? Um, yeah, it keeps a reference to one of these lists. Although, if I've got my own lists, right, then I can prevent you from doing like that. It's not the beginning to return. Yeah. Oh, they're just immutable. They're immutable. They're immutable. <coughs> so provided all the types that I deal with are immutable and final, essentially, then I can restrict it quite a bit. But yeah, there's still weird things that can happen. Yeah, I'm definitely not. It's just um, nothing I can do. I mean, I could actually, I suppose what I could do if I was really being defensive is actually set it up so the compiler puts in a null no test, right, after yeah. the value. Like so the type that comes back from the Java thing is big integer or null. Yeah. It's a union type. And then, right, so th therefore you need to deal with that when you call it. Yeah, I mean, I, I could put some restrictions on that. Yeah, I could do that. There are some, there, you know, I could, I could do that. I, I'm sort of... With respect to your Java method to return a wide new type that encapsulates could be null or could be used to... Yeah. Well, but the whole point is to set it from Wiley. You can call some other Java library that's got some useful functionality in it. You don't want to re-implement in Wiley. Right? <laughs> you have to write this wrapper method around yeah. the library. I, I still think you should, be, you should be able to get the compiler to do that magic for you. Um, well, certainly there are some things I could do. Um, so, for example, I could set it up so that whenever you had a list, it would then build an array list, yeah. for example. I could do some things like that, or a Java list. Um, I could do some things there. Uh, and again, I could set it up so that you could return a normal Java into here and just plug that into a Wiley end. I guess I could do that, that that would be feasible. Um, yeah, it, it is a bit of a challenge, that one. Yeah. Cool. Can you have the list type with uh, generics as well? So you have, you have Wiley runtime list there, can it? Um, so at the moment, I, I don't support that. Um, 
it's difficult because generics don't necessarily translate that well. So, for example, my union types, if I can have one thing or another, what can I call that? In? Well, I can't give it a generic you know, type, if you like. Um, so basically, they're just all, uh, you know, yeah, object. what's the right rule types, essentially. Yeah, and that means whenever it takes something out of this, it has to cast it, this kind of stuff as well. Mm -hmm. does. Yeah. Okay. All right. Anyway, but, so it is possible. Yeah, I am open to opinions, particularly the name. Like, I was trying to think what oh, a good way to do it was. The trouble with your name there is that 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 naming in the class files is used for um, sub inner subclass inner classes. Yeah. Yeah. But you can't write inner class in Wiley, so there's no way to build that inner class. And but I can do it in Java. Sure, but then if I'm going to write sum.java and sum.wiley and compile that in the class file, well, there's a problem, right? They, they conflict hmm. in a sense. So, yeah. But the reason I, in some sense, the reason I chose it was because, in fact, represents them in the class and there's no actual way to express this in a sensible fashion. Um, but I think it causes Eclipse to get confused and think it sometimes isn't in the class mm. when it's not. So I was actually thinking of actually making this actually an inner class. Uh, it occurred to me that I could try you could, I could force people to make this an inner class and stuff, but no. It starts to get a bit weird. Okay, I think we better spin on almost running out of time, yeah. Uh, okay, uh, I don't know how important this is to be honest with you. Um, just, I was going to say a little bit about what it's like to build a programming language. The long and the short of it is it's a nightmare. Um, to be honest, I, mean, I don't know why that's so surprising. Um, I've got about 600 end-to-end -end tests. So each end-to-end -end test is basically a job, a Wiley file, um, and it falls into two categories. It's either a valid Wiley file, in which case it has sample output with it, or it's an invalid Wiley file, in which case it doesn't have output. And so the compiler, when I'm doing the testing, will basically check, well, if it's a valid one, does it have the right output? If it's an invalid one, um, does it throw an actual syntax error or not? Right. Um, and things like an internal, like throwing a null pointer exception does not count as a syntax error. That is a fail. <laughs> okay? um, it's got to be an actual syntax error that represents its saying that it's wrong. Um, ideally, it would be nice that it would say it was wrong in the right place, but I haven't got that in, per se, but I suppose I could do it. Um, and I've also got, <laughs> this is a bit wacky, I've already generated some unit tests for my type system, so trying to get the type system to work properly is actually really difficult, a really difficult uh, computer science challenge. Um, I've got about 15,000 auto-generated unit tests, which is really, really cool, um, but actually doesn't catch all of the bugs. <laughs> <laughs> Which I have to say I find quite confusing, but um, yeah, I guess all the generators tests are funny because they're all very similar, right? And if you just you've got to you've got to write it really well to get good coverage, even in that space. But it certainly helps, and it gives me some fairly good confidence that it does work um, reasonably well. So yeah, so I don't know 600. I don't know how that stacks up really compared to other programming languages, but I obviously want to make it more and try to increase. It. Cool. Oh, and of course the Eclipse plugin. And I could possibly show you the Eclipse plugin, but I don't know if we actually want to go on. We're sort of at 6 30 now. Um, it does syntax highlighting. Doesn't do a whole lot else. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome to download it and install it. You can from the update site that I've made, wiley.org stroke Eclipse, okay? But Please don't send bug reports to me, okay? Um, does it compile? Uh, uh, yes, it actually, it does, kind of, yeah. It will, <laughs> it will compile and you will get those red squiggly lines. Yeah, uh, it actually will do that. I could possibly try and show that. I don't know if it's a good idea or not. Um, but things like creating projects, creating new modules, it gets pretty iffy at, at best. Um, there's a lot of work that needs to go into that. I think what was interesting though is actually it wasn't as bad as I thought it was going to be. Um, I mean, it's not like it's fantastic fun writing in the Clash plugin. I don't know if anyone's had the experience writing here. No, no? okay. Um, it wasn't as bad. I mean, getting syntax highlighting work to work actually took didn't take me a, it took a couple of hours or something like that, right? It was actually quite easy. Um, uh, but it's all the other stuff. It's things like a Wiley project. 
being able to create, um, you know, configure the build path, all of that stuff that is a nightmare. Um, and just trying to, you know, read through all, all the documentation, it's just, it's quite confusing. So, you can um, switch to NetBeans and Bruce will have a plug in for you by the weekend. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm certainly, certainly, I, I do want to have a, an IntelliJ plug in and a NetBeans plug in. John, I might shove the plug up. It's a bit dark on you. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, actually, this, to be honest, I would be quite interested, you know, for the conference, <laughs> you know, people, there must be some people who've got experience with this kind of stuff, so speaking to those people would be quite fun for me, actually. Um, so, yeah, anyway, it's a work in progress. It will come over the summer. I'm planning to try and make it serious so that we can really really use it. That's what's going on in business. And that, as they say, is all. thesis or post-doctoral thesis, or is it an open source project? It's an open source project, it's on GitHub. Um, if you go to Wiley.org, there's a link to the GitHub site there. Um, uh, no, so I'm a lecturer. I lecture at the university. It's, I guess, my research project. Um, I was quite lucky. I got a Marsden grant just this year to work on that. Um, so that's a reasonable chunk of money over the next three years, which will help help get me time out of teaching, and so I can do focus more on Wiley, which is kind of cool, which hopefully should translate into results, you know, like it working, <coughs> that kind of thing. Um, but otherwise, most of it's just my own time, to be honest. I mean, I've probably done 80% of it at home, you know, for the weekends and the evenings, because teaching takes up most of my time. Like, we get this nice period over the summer, which runs from about beginning of December to about sort of February sometime, when I don't have a lot else to do except research. So for that kind of time, I'm basically on this full time. But other than that, it's pretty sketchy. Um, so yeah, that's, you know, in terms of the time frame, it's taken me a lot longer than I wanted to get to here. Um, so we'll see. You know, it's, you know the compiler's like 60,000 lines of code or something. It starts to get a challenge. You're like, hey, I would really love to redesign that whole section. And you start to redesign it and you realize, actually, it's going to take you about two months, isn't it? <laughs> actually, I don't mind something that bad. We'll just go. <laughs> so have you dog food at the compiler? Aha! I love the question. I hate that. Uh, <laughs> no, the answer is no. The compiler is fully written in Java at this stage. Um, I'm hoping with the Java interoperation to start to dog food it. So I've written the JASM, the bytecode disassembler. Oh, yeah which is actually a bytecode assembler, stroke disassembler, in fact. Um, and so I'm going to slot that in as the first component of the compiler written in Wiley. That's my goal. And then slowly start to increase the amount of dog food going on. And I think the Eclipse plugin will really make a big difference. Because uh, I use Emacs, and I've made a sort of Emacs mode for Wiley. But actually, I realize I can't go back to programming with Emacs in the compiler line anymore. I, I like Eclipse too much. You know? I mean. I like a decent IDE too much, is what it means. So I think getting the, the ID, the Eclipse plugin working will make it much easier for you to develop in Wiley, and then the process will start to accelerate. That's my theory. Mm -hmm. yeah. Is the Eclipse plugin support uh, intelligence? Intelligence as in Tammy. Yeah, but that one for a little smile. Did I mention it doesn't support anything except syntax? <laughs> Actually, I can get some icons. I should show you. I mean, I don't know if I'll do one. It's too embarrassing. I can get icons of project things to come up. It took me ages to figure out how to get the little icon. So you go right click the new, and you can say Java project, or you can say Wiley project as well. It took me ages to figure out how to get the little icon to come up there. Okay. Um, yeah. I think it's. They, they say for some reason, I think Scarlet people say that's one of the harder things to do. Like that completion. I don't know why, but for some reason, that completion stuff really caused them a lot of problems. So I'm basically just going to leave that. Well, I've got the advantage that I've got my compiler, so at least I can, if I need to change it, then I can do that. Um, and there are also issues of things like uh, compiling. For those who work in Groovy, I want to use the Groovy Eclipse plugin. So the Groovy Eclipse plugin, actually, I think this came out in the last joke, actually, you talked about it briefly. I didn't understand it at the time, but um, with a Groovy Eclipse plugin, you can compile Java code and Groovy code side by side.
But it's actually quite tricky because you have this dependency issue that do you compile the Java code first, which depends on the Groovy, which might depend on the Groovy code. So if it does depend on the Groovy code, then you've got to compile the Groovy code first so that the class file is replaced with the Java compiler. Or do you compile, or if the Groovy depends on the Java, then you better compile the Java first, so the Groovy, but what if they both depend on each other? Ah, now you've got a problem. And they come up with this really cool trick where um, they modify the Groovy compiler to dump out sort of stub class files which basically don't have anything in them except the type signatures, and so the Java compiler can see that. Then you run the Java compiler, then you run the full Groovy compiler, and overwrite the class files that you generated originally. <laughs> <laughs> and apparently it works. So yeah. the remake is a framework for uh, Debian compilers, so they actually, it calls the each phase on all the compilers. Right. I think they call that a yeah, star yeah, I think, yeah. compiler. I think the IntelliJ guys worked with the Eclipse guys to try and standardize on, on the way yeah, they do that. Yeah, if you write the compilers in a standard way, then, then you basically run, run compile that all your different really files nice. to the first level where you get those signatures, yeah. and yeah. then you go through and... That would be really nice, actually. And, it, and it's actually something that needs to be standardized, because yeah. otherwise everyone will just do it their own way. And yeah, especially with if, all if these it was a standard way, then you just write your compiler to that standard, and it can interoperate with... <coughs> That would, I would be so happy for that. And you say, you know, they do them different ways. Well, they do already, because Groovy does it like that. Scala has got a Java parser built into their compiler. So there, the, so you always compile Scala first, and it actually goes in and interrogates the Java source files. Right? It so, could pre so, present some issues. In theory, like, if you yeah. do it properly, it's, it doesn't seem like it's that hard a problem. Mm. If you write your compiler so that they're modular, so that the master compiler can... Yeah. Say each, but I completely agree, but it means getting those people, you know, it means the stand, you know, getting people yeah. to do it, that's the thing. I, technically, it, yeah, it's really good. Cool, okay. I think that's probably it. Mm -hmm. uh, and come to the exceptional conference and I'll show you why they work. <laughs> I'm going to show it tonight, but we'll see about time. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. And,